Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Impact Everywhere, the podcast that looks for people having a positive impact in unexpected places. Today, we introduce to you Graham Ross, who is a serial entrepreneur dialing in all the way from Australia, who during a midlife crisis switched careers into the fashion industry. Now, of course, this isn't a story about how Graham started a fashion line just to look more fashionable, but rather a story about how Graham, while pulling on a thread of curiosity, eventually discovered an entire industry that was absolutely toxic and wanted to do something about it. Every single year, the fashion industry uses over 80 billion pieces of clothing, and it is absolutely unsustainable because of the fashion cycles that have been going on. Of course, Graham was so curious at how he might start solving the problem, so he went about trying to create the greenest t-shirt on the planet. That t-shirt made from agricultural waste ended up being his first product, which then grew into an entire clothing line called Kusaga Athletica. But when he realized that no matter how many t-shirts he sold, he was never going to be able to compete with the major fashion retailers, he decided that he would take a more technological approach, starting an entire company focused on recycling textile waste. Now, this is a guy who has no experience in petrochemical recycling, and that is precisely why I thought his story was interesting. Graham sits on the intersection of worlds, and as you guys know, I love people who sit on the intersection of worlds because they didn't know it wasn't supposed to be done that way. Now in this week's episode, Graham talks about how he essentially Googled his way into trying to solve one of the world's greatest challenges, how he built up a company inside of the fashion industry despite not having any experience, and last but not least, what he does to stay inspired in order to keep fighting the good fight. I hope you guys enjoy this week's episode. This is Graham talking about what happened right after he quit his day job in media and television production. I found myself through an opportunity from our family to move and live overseas, to park that career for some time and spend time being a father, which was uh, really enjoyable and watching my wife's career grow. I also had the opportunity to get a little fitter. So I, I started um, exercising. I found myself doing marathons and triathlons. And every time you do one of these races, they give you what they call a finisher shirt. And one day I opened up my wardrobe and apart from all the, the sort of the cycling and running gear I had, I literally had a half of the wardrobe full of these finisher shirts. And I thought, that's really interesting. I don't wear them. I literally wear them twice after the race because you're hot and sweaty and then on the plane home because you want everybody to know that you did the race. And the reason I didn't wear them was because they often didn't fit properly. The fabric really felt terrible. I, I called a few of my friends as a kind of a, a test case and said, do you guys wear these shirts? And they all basically rep replied the same. I had to go back to the wardrobe, understand what they were made of, and most of them were made out of polyester, and I had no idea what that kind of meant. And so I went to everybody's friend Google and researched polyester, and, and I was incredibly shocked by what polyester was actually made out of and the impact that the manufacturing of that garment had on the planet, but then also the fact that there was no plans for end of life. And I, like most people, I had a whole bunch of cotton garments I had some spandex and I had some nylon. So I did further research and I was, again, shocked what I perceived as being a natural shirt. My T-shirt made out of 100% cotton you know, could require up to 3,000 litres of water to um, grow and manufacture. And, and the crops that were grown were really heavily pesticide. And the, the industry was telling me this is a natural material. So I thought, surely there is other, other fabrics out there. We're a smart, smart society. We put people on the moon. And so I, I did some more further research and obviously discovered silk and bamboo and hemp. But they weren't really great running shirts. And so I did further research, I ended up in white papers put out by universities and, and a whole lot of stuff that probably I didn't have any right to have any understanding. But because I had a background in media, I knew how to research a topic and understand things pretty quickly. And so I found about 11 new fibers and I did the old school thing. I picked up the phone and I rang up all these laboratories, all these companies and inquired as to whether I could get some with some funny conversations because I wasn't anybody from the fashion industry and I wasn't a large company. But over a period of time, they gratefully gifted me those fibers. And then I actually had to go back to Google again and understand once I've got these fibers, how do you make a fabric? And so after a bit of research and a few more phone calls around the world, I managed to find a manufacturer in Malaysia, oh, no, sorry, in Korea, and approached them and said, I've got these fibers you've never heard of. I want to make some fabric. And that again was some funny conversations. But what was great about that over a period of time and a lot of, obviously a lot of failures, but a lot of collaborative working, we managed to make three plant-based fabrics. 
and a polyester run shirt. And so that kind of, that was kind of my step. So when you started this, is it accurate to say that really you were going through the equivalent of a midlife crisis and you were following your curiosity and one thing led to the other? Were you actually planning to build a company? Was this whole thing designed to build a company to be the next decade of your life? Or was this just, oh, why doesn't what I want exist in the world? Let me try and see if I can make it. It, it was absolutely curiosity. Is this, is this possible? And if this is possible, this is actually a game changer. And then obviously I, I've worked for myself most of my life. So forming a company wasn't something that was foreign. I knew that I would have to do that, certainly from an operational point of view, but also from an IP protection point of view. But I was incredibly curious because whilst I wasn't directly dealing with fashion, I was dealing within the supply chain, the mechanics of the manufacturing the products or the raw materials to go into the products that we wear every day. And I found that incredibly fascinating because I imagined it to be this highly sophisticated, really clever functioning industry. But what it actually is a whole lot of fragmented factories and companies and logistics across the world. So I found that incredibly fascinating, but also the development and the creation of something was just incredibly rewarding because I didn't have the technical knowledge to understand how to make a fabric. I didn't have technical knowledge how to make a fiber, but I had the ability to join the dots to put the right people together to be able to achieve what I need to achieve. What was really interesting is people are really will answer the question if you ask the right question. And people also really get excited about your curiosity and your enthusiasm for something. And so by doing that, I found myself not having to talk to people from a technical point of view. I just need to show them or tell them where I wanted to get to and how I wanted to do that. And then they filled in the blanks. Over that time, I was able to gather enough technical knowledge to then be able to drive the project forward because I could have more technical conversations. So you mentioned just now asking the right question. How do you know that you're asking the right question? Can you give me an example of what a right question is versus a wrong question? I, I go in with enough knowledge to be able to elicit the conversation. And then I allow the person to then drive the knowledge back towards me. And then I can pick up the questions off the back of that. At the end, if you haven't quite got it, you, you can kind of go and say, is there anything I'm missing here? Is there something that maybe you think would be more valuable to me? So you allow them to give you the gift of the knowledge. And I think that's really empowering to people and, and allows you to jump over that kind of question answer backwards and forwards. What you have to do is you've got to set it up slowly. So it's about connection with the human being you're having a conversation with. But you've got to find a, a rapport at the start and you've got to set up a big enough picture that makes people interested to want to continue the conversation and then know exactly what you need to get out of this person. You may not ask that until the 10th question. Often asking as the first question is not going to achieve what you need to achieve. Um, you, need to, you need to gain their trust, their rapport. You need to understand that, that you're there to, to, to give value back to them, importantly, as they are giving value back to you. And you'll find people will be more generous with that sort of knowledge when you are open yourself up and be very open about what you're trying to achieve and the fact that maybe you don't know everything. Perfect. So basically... Just doing enough homework to start the conversation and then being curious and letting that drive the rest of it in order to collect what you what actually information that you're actually looking for. Yeah, exactly. You, you do yourself and the person you're talking to a disservice if you turn up to a phone call and you're not prepared because at the end of the day, you're trying to find something out. And that conversation or that introduction can unlock a key. And it, it might only be just a small step in your journey, but it might also be a large step. But it's also that person becomes part of your network. Growing your network is incredibly important when you're an entrepreneur. It is the key point of what you're trying to do because the person you meet today may be of no value to you or you may be of no value to them today. But in 12 months, two years time, when you've got an idea, then you can come back to that. And so you always got to leave that person um, with a great memory of that, your conversation and the fact that you are the person you are. And so when you call up, then there's a reason for them to interact with you again. That's great. So what, what I hear from your flow in terms of how you went about this, you weren't really trying to have an impact in the world. You were really just trying to solve a problem. And as you went deeper and you pulled on that thread, you realized that the problem was actually a lot bigger. I've heard time and again from entrepreneurs that are not in the impact space that really you have to start with a problem. You have to solve someone's problem first and foremost. Is that kind of the same attitude that you had when you were going into this? Or were you really trying to also fuse this idea of making the world a better place and creating a successful business and balancing those two mindsets at the same time? Yes, it was about solving a problem. 
And at that stage, early in, in the career, I was lucky to have a, a business partner and we kind of were collaborating on, on this journey. And he was coming from the impact perspective and I was coming from the business perspective. And what was interesting as we went on, solving the problem was really important because you can't have an impact if you're not making an influence. Sometimes I find in the impact space, there's a lot of conversation about the problem, about the, the impact we can have. But a, as we have with circular economy, it's a circular conversation. We just keep talking about stuff. We really need to drive things in through the solving of a problem, an actionable item, right? You're better to lead than to be a follower. And, and followers often converse about <laughs> what should be done. And I'd rather be the person who's going, well, I'm going to go and do this, whether that's the right thing to do or, or to, it proves that it's successful or not. But what happened as I went along and my curiosity grew, and I'm a father of two children. I try to live a low impact life. I, I predominantly ride, I do the right thing. We don't eat meat, all that sort of stuff. But the further I got it, the more passion I got about this problem and, the, and that's what drives me. And I think as I've got long and we've had some challenges in the, both businesses that I have, if I was doing it for money, I would have given up a long time ago because it's easy to solve a problem. It's harder to change an attitude. And what we need to do to make this world more sustainable is we have to change people's attitudes. And that doesn't happen overnight. That happens through a, a series of influences, both um, close to them and externally. And it, and it also changes through looking at success stories of businesses or, or people. And that's where attitudes change. And so often we talk about impact and we talk about changing attitudes and that's incredibly hard. That just, that takes a lot of time. And if you can build a business that is showing the way that people can buy into, like a, a clothing brand, they go, I put the shirt on. I know this is a sustainable shirt. It's made ethically. This makes me feel good. That helps change attitudes. That doesn't mean they're going to stop driving their car. It doesn't mean they stop using um, you know, their electricity from a coal-fired plant. It doesn't mean they're going to stop eating, eating meat. But it's their starting point. And that starting point you'll find, and I've seen that with my family, I've seen it with my friends, by, by make, giving them the opportunity to wear a sustainable T-shirt, I've seen them change their life, but it's taken five to 10 years. It just doesn't happen overnight. I thought it was really interesting to hear you say that you're not in the business of selling shirts. You're in the business of changing attitudes, or that's how I interpreted it. And on that note, I'm actually curious, what do you consider a successful person? Who would you consider to be successful? If that's indeed the kinds of narratives that we are looking to reconstruct in the world. Yeah, interesting question. I think from a business point of view, I don't define myself whether you is success business, what does that look like? Is it money? Is it impact on the world? Is it the fact you made a product? Um, for me, success is proving my hypothesis. And so if I say, I think there's an opportunity to make the greenest t-shirt on the planet, success for me is actually doing that. That doesn't mean it's not a business perspective, but a personal success is really important. I think success is where businesses or individuals have an impact on society in a positive way that moves forward. And that is often contrary to what mainstream is doing. What happens often is that we feel that it's hard to make a difference. It, it, it depends what kind of difference you want to make. So if your difference is as simple as buying a sustainable t-shirt, well, you're making a difference. Because when you go to that, go to the shop to go and meet your friends and they say, oh, that's a nice shirt, you get to say, this is a sustainable shirt. And you get to share the story of that shirt and to educate those people. Now, they may not do anything, but they now know that and that conversation flows. And I think success is really personal and, and it can be defined different ways. But for me, predominantly, it's about here's my hypothesis. Did I prove it? If I prove it, that's a success. And, and that's what then I go looking for what's the next hypothesis and I try to prove that. And often I get to bring people along the journey with me and that is incredibly rewarding. Cool. So back to the businesses again. Was the reason why you decided to shift from creating the greenest t-shirt on the planet into what you're currently working on, Blocktex, a result of the fact that you were successfully able to prove out your hypothesis on designing an entire clothing line built around green materials? Or was it more a frustration that you had plateaued? What was the catalyst for deciding to take things forward? Blocktex was created because... I got further knowledge of how the, the supply chain and how the fashion and textile industry operated. 
And whilst it was incredibly satisfying and still is to have a, a sustainable activewear and sportswear company, I realized that well, I knew that we were never going to be Nike or Adidas. The impact we had was um, significant to the people who love the brand. But what I saw was there was a global challenge for the industry going forward. Before our clothes were even made, we're losing about 10 to 15% of offcuts in the manufacture of our, our shirts and our dresses. So from the raw fabric, so it's 10 or 15% of everything that's made each year is ready for landfill. There is some reuses, but a lot of it goes to landfill. And then our clothing at the end of lifestyle, there's obviously you can donate it to the charity. Second life and reuse is fantastic. And there's a huge second hand clothing market around the world. But fast fashion has created such an issue. We've driven the supply chain rather than having four seasons to having 12. Some businesses drop a new range every four to six weeks. And so the volumes of clothing around the world has just escalated. There's about 100 billion garments made each year, year on year. And, and at some point, if you're wearing it once or twice, where does it go? It, it, so effectively what I saw, there's this huge amount of textile waste. But, but my access point was because I'd spent time making my own fibers and making my own fabrics, I knew that there was an inherent value in those products. So there's a cost to those. So once it went into a garment, and was sold to us as consumers, we just threw it away. We didn't care because there was no ownership to us and we didn't realize what this cost. And the industry itself wasn't set up to recover that back. Either the technology hadn't been recovered or it was just easy to keep making the same thing and pumping it out. So I was looking at, you know, people saw that ripped and stained and torn t-shirt. I actually saw three or $4. <laughs> and so there's actually money there. So if we can recover that back, not only can we feed that back in supply chain as recycled materials, we reduce the impact because we're not making raw materials. So manufacturing costs come down, the CO2 emissions come down, our impact comes down. And it would be a fantastic business because it's predicted about by 2030, there's going to be about 140 million tons of textiles going to landfill around the world. This time around though, when you decided to tackle, you know, the next tier above, you weren't actually just assembling a subset of solutions in the same way that you had to find fibers. In this case, you almost had to completely invent a new technology that still doesn't really quite exist. No one else is doing it. And so we're talking about this vast knowledge gap, not only in terms of like how, but then even if you figured it out, how to recycle clothing, which is very complicated because you're adding all these different blends of fibers and uh, organic fibers versus plastic fibers and different kinds of plastics. Ultimately, the gap in knowledge here is really wide. H how did you go about closing that gap? I think people all around the world see big problems all the time. They get frustrated all the time, but most don't even know where to start because the problem is so big. What was it like for you? Yeah, equally, you start with the big picture. So understand what does it look like? What does the workflows look like? Like where do all the clothes go? How much is being made? Where's it all being made? Just understand that. So you've got an understanding of things. Then what I do is I go really big and then I go really small. And so the really small bit was I went to my local charity. And Australians are very good at donating their unwanted clothes to charities. And I went to the charity and I said, Okay, so what happens with your clothes? If I donate my clothes, what happens? So understood. what I need to do is understand their business model. And the business model is effectively they sell about 20% and 80% gets sent overseas. I said, so where does it go to? And they've gone, well, it goes to this country. And I said, yeah, so what happens then? What do you mean? I said, so if it goes there and if people take that, it's fantastic. But if they don't, what happens then? And they actually didn't know. And so for me, we've got this business model where clothes are shipped overseas to these secondhand markets, but we don't ultimately know whether they are reused or do they just end up in somebody else's landfill. My landfill is as important as your landfill. It's a, the same planet. And so once I understood the wider scope, I came down to that minus split and I knew, okay, I can make an influence here in my country that will actually have an influence globally. The foundation of our business, Blocktex, sits under blockchain technology. It allows us to track and trace materials we not only can identify it coming into our facility but also when it's broken back into the raw materials then they've got their identification and so it goes into the next product you can tell the history of that product and then the goal is to get that back from the second life to be recycled again and again so understanding that allowed me to trace those garments going to those countries to know where are they can we get them back the second thing was to identify the most common fabrics that we could recover and one of the biggest challenges we've had, we can recycle single blends. So we can recycle polyester, we can recycle cotton. 
But up until a few years ago, we weren't able to separate blended fabrics like polyester cotton. So think about something like your linen, your tablecloths, your sheets, your favorite shirt. So when you put polyester and cotton together and in blended, that takes up basically 80% of the world's fabrics and fibers. And so that's a good food group to start with. There was some emerging technologies around the world who were able to separate, but they sacrificed either by the polyester or the cotton. And from our point of view, we didn't want to do that. It was pointless having a technology that separated a material back, but then you create another waste stream. So we didn't want to create any waste. And we then went and did a lot of research in uh, technologies. We looked at enzymes, we looked at chemicals, we looked at what other people were doing. And I'd had a relationship with a local university and they were doing some interesting things with some enzymes. And we were having some conversations about what we're doing, what they were doing. And between the two of us, we were able to come up with some sort of hypothesis as to what might be a, a possible conditions to separate the polyester and cotton and retain both of those materials. We unlocked the cotton from the polyester. The polyester is then melted, extruded, and turned back into pellets, which are the raw building blocks for, for many things, such as clothing, injection molding, you know, tabletops, that sort of stuff. And the cotton is broken down into a cellulose powder. Cellulose is used in many industries. It can be manufactured back into fiber. Cellulose is used as a thickener in paints and adhesives, industrial uses. Remarkably, there's so many things you learn. It's used in food as a thickener. It's used in cosmetics and it's used in pharmaceuticals. And so what used to be clothing that ended up in landfill now has the opportunity to be recovered, to go back into many industries that will impact the way they do their business and lower their impact on the planet. And I think what you've created is phenomenal, especially considering that you have absolutely no experience in petrochemical recycling in like any capacity. And so as you narrate the story, it's one thing led to the other thing and it all you know makes perfect sense. But I'm sure that when you were in the midst of it, it was most probably extremely chaotic. And so I want to revisit the the point you made about going through the different stages between each stage of chaos, what do these sub-stages look like for anyone who is looking to tackle a really large and big problem? So the way I approach it is find the big problem. What, what's the big, hairy, audacious goal? You've got to aim for Mars if you want to get to the moon and then come back to a micro space. But because you've looked at the final vision, you then have an ability to work back the stages from that. And I think one of the challenges I have is that because I've already seen what might possibly be the future, I'm already there. But when I'm back in that small time and trying to go through these stages, I have to realize that not everybody sees what I see because they haven't been through that journey with myself. And so what I have to do is come back and realize that at each stage, I have to create an influence in the people that I'm working with to achieve to get to that next level. So it's like, I've seen what it looks like from the top of the mountain, but I have to get to each ledge and each ledge is really important, but you, each ledge, you have to bring people up to that ledge with you. But importantly, when you get to that ledge, you have to pause and you have to take stock about why you're here and where you are. Think about where you are as in the next ledge, because you can get really lost by knowing what's at the top of the mountain and wanting to get there quickly. And then if you skip over a stage, then it's a house of cards, it falls, it falls down. It's really important to know who you need on that ledge and how you're gonna to get to that next stop. But importantly, you need to stop, take a pause, check in with everybody, but then also look out to make sure that the, the direction you're heading in is the right direction. Should you head straight up or should you head to the side? And each stage gives you more knowledge and more validation of your concept, your idea. You may need to just take a little side pivot for a period of time. It might be financial influence. It might be environmental influence. It might be the fact that you're in the middle of a, a pandemic. You have to take that on board. And you also have to have realized that, and this is something my wife often points out, I'm incredibly passionate and driven. That doesn't mean everybody I work with is. And so there's times you have to check in with the people you're working with because sometimes you can be too driven, you can be too passionate, you can be too on for too long and people just need a break. And um, so I've had to learn that. So how do you identify when you've reached a ledge? Do you, is this something that you pre-plan and you say, oh, I, we're going to start with determining whether or not blockchain is absolutely vital in order to 
for transparency? Like the first step we're going to do is transparency. Or do you really just say, okay, we have this big vision. I'm just going to keep going until I look back and no one's following me. <laughs> I'm going to slow down a little bit and try to pull them back along. What do your ledges look like? And are they predefined? They are in my mind. And at times I may write that down, but I know where I want to go. And obviously, as you build out your business, and you work with people, you have to be much more organized in regards to how you articulate that. You've got to have planning and strategies and that sort of stuff. But if it's just me, I know where I want to go. I know what kind of feels right. I often have got many things going. So I'm, I'm chasing multiple ledges because you sometimes have to push everything up and then not prioritize anything and then identify the right one to prioritize at that time. What I often find also is that I know that I'm on the right ledge because I may get, rather than me pushing out into my network, comes back to me. And so you can do that through a few things. You can do it through just a general conversation into a few people and somebody might introduce you to somebody to move you forward. Press is often really helpful. If you can get an article somewhere, and then people will reach out to you and that they may come with some help or some support or often people come just to want to see what you're doing and that can be helpful or not helpful. And then what I do is I've got a group of really good people who know me and I pitch to them and I constantly pitch. And when I started Block Techs, I, I pitched to about 25 different people and from all over my network and outside of my network, people who I knew would disagree with what I was trying to do because what I want to do was validate whether the idea I had was actually feasible, but also understand how everybody saw my perspective and what I may have missed. And so every time I get to a ledge, I reach out to certain people. I often try to find people who will disagree with me because you want to understand possibly why it might not work. So if a CEO walked into a large fashion brand and said to the board, I think we should do more for the environment. Let's sell 20% less next year. I don't, not quite sure he's going to have a job. So you're pushing into an industry that is predicated to selling you a product, right? So you can't just turn up and knock down the door. You have to find a way in and influence. And so the best way to understand what that might be is to jump the enemy's wall and, and have a conversation and say, this is what I'm thinking. What, what do you think? And, and people will often tell you what they don't like more than what they do. And so that then allows you to come back and form how you might be able to go the next step. So it sounds like conversations are really your secret weapon. It's what you use for everything from knowledge collection to convincing people to work with you, even if you have no experience in the field. Tell me the story of how you convinced a university to come on board with this big experiment of yours. <laughs> I, I already had a relationship. So the fact that I'd created a, a sustainable fashion brand gave me some validation in, in the marketplace. And I had picked up an understanding of how textiles are made and, and how the industry works. And so that allowed me to go to that next stage. Often universities have got an incredible knowledge and they can create amazing things, but they're not that great at commercializing that. Entrepreneurs or people from a business background have got a great idea, way of understanding how to commercialize things. The conversation between myself and my business partner in the university was around, this is what we think is possible. They had a few other thoughts. If we had gone with their thoughts, we wouldn't be where we are today because where they were focused on was a small part of the market. They'd had some success. They knew that they could do something, but it was not going to be commercially viable. We took their technology and added our knowledge, but then wrapped around a business model that you could commercialize that technology. And that's why we end up with polyester cotton and where we are today. And so What's been great with the university and I think where they saw the opportunity was that there was an opportunity to collaborate and whilst we could all sit around a table, we weren't all looking at it from the same perspective, but each party brought something together to be able to realize this and, and what they saw was an opportunity that could form a framework for future working with other companies. Obviously, we still think differently, but what, what's been great is we've been able to see what each other's bringing to the goal. And we've worked out how to work together. And off the back of that, we're now working with three universities in Australia on different projects. And we've taken the same methodology into the, each one of those. The theme in there that, that I really love is that you are always thinking about what value you can bring to other people, not what value you can take away from others. So even in the case of the university, you're like, what can I do to help take you from where you are to where you want to be? And what you were actually bringing to the table is this business component. Ultimately, every, everyone is trying to live out their own life. So if you can better understand what other people's needs are, then you will be probably more successful at accomplishing whatever it is you're trying to get done. 
it, you can create impact through product or from the way you behave or the way you collaborate with people or the way you can help them be better at what they do. And so I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think that's culturally, we as a business, that's what we're bringing. Yes, we've got clever technology. Yes, we're really serious about what we're doing. Yes, we've got an environmental impact. But that doesn't mean we can't help those people we work with as we go along. And equally, by doing that, you learn so much more about yourself and what you're trying to achieve. But also, I just I continue to use, I ask those questions. So if I'm trying to work with a university or anybody to achieve something, I'm constantly understanding how I'm articulating what I'm trying to achieve because I don't have the technical knowledge, but I don't necessarily need to. I just need to know how to ask the right questions or how to motivate somebody to help me get to my next stage. And so I'm continually learning. There's, I don't have all the answers. Each meeting and each project we do, I learn more about how I can do that and how I can move forward. And then you should be doing that from a positive value exchange, not from barking at somebody because you're paying them. Definitely. And so What's your co-founder relationship like, both in terms of how you drew him into the table and how you balance each other out? I was bouncing around pitching this concept to all these people. I, I pitched it to one of my friends and she said, you need to meet this guy. He's a successful fashion retail CEO. He's currently got some time in his hands. I've been nervous pitching this business probably to two people. One was to my wife because it was really important I was changing things. And the second was to him because he was somebody who knew. It. And from the moment I pitched to him, he was incredibly uh, gracious to listen to what I had to say. Once he heard the pitch, he said, I'll never forget, he said, nobody thinks about the business like this, Graham. And off the back of that, he eventually bought into the business. And so we both got skin in the game here in this business. We are different people from the perspective of he's got a, a massive 30-year history in this industry, so he knows where all the skeletons are buried. I'm the guy who just turns up and keeps asking, but why? Why do you do it that way? Why don't we do this way? But we're very collaborative. This is the best business relationship I've had because we're a little bit older. There's no ego. We're both co-founders. We don't have titles. We both do the presentations, pick up the awards, and put the bins out. And so it's a very flat perspective. He brings an incredible knowledge of the retail industry, of people management. He's a trained economist. He's got great financial background. I've worked for myself most of my life, and you know, I guess for, as an entrepreneur. So I've got that understanding of drive and thinking about strategy. What does the future look like? How do we get to things? Who are the people we need to put in place? What do we need to do? The continual but why question. And so we balance each other out from that perspective. But we also, I guess most importantly, we, we incredibly respect each other's personality, intellect, experience. But equally, we always promised ourselves that we would have the tough questions, the tough conversations. So if there's a decision to be made and one agrees or we agree or don't agree, we, we nut it out until we get to a decision. And once the decision's made, that's it, it's final. And so it's really refreshing to have a relationship that outside of your family where you can have that really open conversation and not feel like, there's got to be doors slammed or people are going to feel upset about things. And that's what's allowed us to accelerate this business. And we've been in business partners for just over two years from meeting cold to being where we are today. And I think that's been incredibly successful, incredibly rewarding. And I look forward to being his business partner for many years forward. Super beautiful. It sounds like you really have the outsider advantage. So I think most people coming into a brand new field would often think that they're at a disadvantage. But in your case, you seem to consistently say how great of an advantage it is. Do you think it's only an advantage because you're combining an outside perspective along with curiosity? Or what is the magical formula that makes you so well adapted to solving these problems? It's curiosity. You've got to be inquisitive. What I think it is, and I think comes back from my television making days, I've been lucky to make programs about people who have been incredibly passionate about stuff that I have no idea about. And if you spend time with somebody who's passionate about something, whether he's the guy that paints your walls or whether they're an incredible sculptor or artist, when you listen to somebody talk with passion, you get an insight into the world that you don't actually have. And I think children are inquisitive because they haven't experienced everything. So everything is new and exciting. But as we get older, we, get, we throw a whole bunch of other things on ourselves and we forget about that. And so what I find really interesting is that I love going to an event where I don't know anybody. You just never know what conversation you're going to have. 
and often I, you find people, there's often somebody standing there on, on their mobile phone. So they're the first person I go and talk to. I say, why are you on your mobile phone? Hi, I'm Graham. What brings you here? And off the back of that, I've met so many incredibly interesting people off the back of that. They, they talk about their business. They talk about what they're interested in. So that just goes in your knowledge bank. And for me, that's incredibly, and it allows me to also learn about how do I ask the question to find the answers. I'm already inquisitive, but being inquisitive doesn't give you the answers. You've got to learn how to ask the right questions to get the answers back. But also equally, you've got to give value first. And what you'll find is by the end of the night, they're bringing people to meet you. Oh, you've got to come meet Graham. He's doing whatever. And they're like one to many. So your network grows not from you meeting 100 people. It's by you meeting one person who could then introduce you to 100 people. And, and that, that I think is really important. But equally, you now have that person in your network. And so I can provide value back to them by saying, oh, you should meet so-and-so because I think you guys will get on. And I've had the pleasure to do that many times in my life. And it makes me excited every time I can do that because I know how much that helps me. And giving that gift to somebody else is, is really rewarding. I think that's really one of the great things about being in business is your ability to meet many people, but also provide value back to them. It's one of the rules of what, how to win friends and influence people. Give people the opportunity to talk about themselves. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I, I think you do it wonderfully and um, must be particularly hard during COVID times to get any of that sort of serendipitous conversation going, unfortunately. When it comes to discipline, routine and habits, you're someone who's self-employed, coming up with ideas, creating your own schedule. What role do discipline, routine, and habits play in making sure that you keep going from one space to the other to the next? So there's a lot of things can be said for going out for a long bike ride and coming back with a lot of answers. As my business coach says, I'm fascinated, not frustrated. So if I'm at a point where I'm frustrated, I, I go out and have a run or a bike ride. I think what it shuts down your active brain and allows your subconscious to come forward and I often find that if I'm not sleeping very well, I need to get that blockage. Or my wife tells me, <laughs> you need to go for a bike ride because you kept me awake all night last night. So I do that and I've learned that's a really good thing. Equally, taking time to read about stuff that isn't directly connected to what you're doing. Because I find constantly thinking about what I do each day, talking about environment, worrying about the climate change stuff, just it muddies my thought process. But if I can find something that's maybe a degree or two degrees to the left or right of that, it allows me to uh, relax, open up the pathways in my mind while still being connected with other thoughts that might be around what I'm doing and to bring that influence back in, which ties back to what we were discussing before. You can't change people's attitudes overnight, but you can start at any time. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm really diligent about is I'm very disciplined when I work. I've created a life where I can be anywhere, anytime working. I have a laptop, everything lives in the cloud. I'm very used to being mobile. And so I've got all the devices I need to be able to work out of an airport, on a plane, at the beach, whatever. And I can be incredibly focused at doing that. I can really lock into the process and, and be completely absorbed into that. I don't easily get distracted unless I want to be. And when I'm distracted, I'm, I'm hopeless. <laughs> Let's enjoy ourselves. But generally, I can be really focused and I can do that um, day after day after day without needing to stop. And so I've been really blessed with that. But then equally, you do need to take time off. The discipline is about if you're working, work. If you're not working, don't. But you can't do half. That doesn't achieve anything. Wow. I'm so jealous of your ability to just enter into a state of flow and, and just produce, which is really great. But I'm sure there are moments in time where you lose motivation. And once you lose motivation, that's probably the hardest thing to pick back up. What strategies do you have when that happens, when maybe you hit a wall and you're like, oh, I don't know, a pandemic happened or crap, we, we aimed too high and now these funders are turning us down or so on and so forth. That happens when motivation disappears. I, I accept failure really easily. So if you go, here's our experiment and we fail, that's okay because you learned something from it, right? And so if you continually pushing the envelope, you're going to fail. You just got to accept that. I also accept that sometimes you do a good pitch, sometimes you do a good interview, sometimes you don't, sometimes you do a bad presentation. That's kind of part of it. You just got to take it and, and move on. Because I'm inquisitive, where I lose motivation is where I'm stopped. And it's not because of my motivation or my enthusiasm, because there's a gatekeeper. I hate gatekeepers. And, and gatekeepers can come in many forms. It's people who don't see your vision, people who are threatened by your vision, people who just can actually go out of their way to stop you getting either that next piece of knowledge 
or getting an introduction or whatever. That's a, that just infuriates me because they're just in your road. And so you've got to work away. Do I go over them, around them or under them or whatever? But that demotivates me. I think what also demotivates me is when the timeline of your expectation to get something up and running is, is extended. And I have to refocus and, and accept that. That's the one thing my wife, I think she's learned over the years of being married with me is when I lose my interest, then it's done. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm out of there. So I have to you know, I have to find that interest and keep going. And up to date, I've done that. You just There's times you have to sit yourself down and you have to talk to yourself and say, Graham, you need to be an adult. You're not throwing your toys out of the cot now because you're bored and you know, <laughs> you're uninterested. You have to turn up. You've put all this work into it. People are relying on you act like an adult, be a grown-up. And so there's times you do have to talk to yourself. And sometimes I do that. On, that's when I'll go out for a bike ride. And I'll go through this kind of conversations. I'll identify why I'm feeling like this. I'll identify who's the roadblock. Can I change it? Can I not change it? If I can't change it, then I have to accept that that's what that is. And I have to say, grow up <laughs> and crack on. And so then you come back, okay, and often you come back, okay, okay, well, that's a roadblock. I'm just going to take a step to the right. And then away you go. And so I'm instantly motivated by that. All right, man. I, I just want to ask one last question. If you had a microphone to the world and you were able to tell them anything, whether that was a word of encouragement or a word of whatever, what would that be? It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We just, we need to just every day get out the door, do their best, be nice to other people, be nice to ourselves, be kind to ourselves, and it'll be okay. There isn't anybody who has ever gone for a run and come back and said, that was a waste of time. I didn't enjoy that. But often it's really hard to get outside the door. So the secret to that is to put your shoes outside the door. So when you walk out and you put your shoes on, then you're out, you're out. So your miles will go and then you're motivated. So that's my analogy to the world. It's going to be okay and put your shoes outside the, the door because you never know what you're going to discover outside that door, who you're going to meet, how you're going to influence people. And I think barring current times of pandemics, there's a huge lot of opportunities here at this, this present time. There's obviously challenges and, and tragedy, but it's a huge opportunity for the world to retool the way we operate. And by naturally by doing that, let's look at what we want our business to be in 10, 20, 50 years. And I think sometimes we need to be looking at 10, 20, 50 years is what value do we give back to our employees? What value do we give to our customers? And what value can we give back to the environment? And I think when businesses think like that, then the world is going to be an amazing place for everybody. Couldn't agree more. I love that shoe analogy. Where should people go to either follow, would it be Blocktex? Would it be Kusaga? Like what, where should people go to keep up with your exploits and to stay in tune with what happens next? Yeah, cool. I always welcome people connecting with me. You can find fashion company Kusaga Athletic, K-U-S-A-G-A athletic.com and Blocktex, which is spelled B-L-O-C-K-T-E-X-X.com. It, it, is, a, it is emerging. We will hopefully be at commercial scale next year. And I, you can find me on LinkedIn, all the socials. I welcome having conversation with people. And if, the, if I can provide value back to you, please reach out. Always welcome it. And, and equally, if there's any value you can provide back to both those companies, we're, you know, we welcome that as well. All right, guys, that's it for this week's episode. I hope you took away a bunch of tips and tricks on how you can set your sights on a really big vision and try to find a way to solve it by just Googling your way, having conversations and just being friendly and curious. If you guys are enjoying this and you want to get access to some visuals to share with your friends and family, just head over to impacteverywhere.org. Every single week, my team and I prepare quotes, audiograms and things that are just social media friendly in order to try to get the word out as much as possible. Next week, we're trying something brand new. We're bringing two people on board simultaneously both Hugo and Diego, who work for an advertising agency called AKQA. And while they're not technically impact individuals in the traditional sense of the word, they have created projects that are really impactful. And so I was really curious to invite them on board to talk about some of the things that they're working on, including one particular project that's super close to my heart, which is called Code of Conscience. If you guys are curious about it, Google it right away to get a sneak peek. But otherwise, just stay tuned, stay inspired, and be sure to check back next week because impact is everywhere. <laughs>